Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So one, there are weapons. Two, there are, there's warfare. And three, these weapons are not carnal. Carnal is fleshy, body, physical. But these are not carnal, but mighty enough to pull down strongholds. Strongholds are fortifications. Strongholds are defenses. But around those defenses, it is the matchless name of God Almighty and the power of God. Right? If God be for us. I mean, I was so, you know, completely compelled the moment you, you know, said that word. Because that is the essence of what we're going to talk about. When God is with us, who can be against us? Strongholds. Fortifications, any kinds of weapons of war, weapons of destruction are nothing and nullified in the presence of God Almighty. So it says, it's not carnal, but it's mighty to pull down strongholds. We are composed of three elements, body, soul, and spirit. So what happens when our body becomes sick? Right? When our body becomes sick, God Almighty in His infinite wisdom has given us a defense system. Technically, if you ask the doctors, they tell you it's the white blood corpuscles, right? WBCs. And the WBCs are the ones which fight those germs and kill and nullify those germs and help us to cure. In fact, increasingly, and this is very exciting, you know, increasingly, from the hallowed portals of Oxford and Howard, they are now making research to show that our body doesn't need any medicines. I'm serious. But the body doesn't need any medicine because God has created us as unique creatures who have an internal different system created by God Almighty. That is why when the psalmist said, he said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Because if you are fearfully and wonderfully made, there has to be a system, there has to be a mechanism that beats those germs out of the system. We have everything. We have everything in us. It's the pharma industry. God bless if there's anybody from the pharma medical industry. But we have everything in us to ensure that the defense system is perfect. Praise the Lord. Now, look at the mental level, right? In our minds, we have crazy thoughts. You know, we are excited, we are enamored when we come for a lovely worship, when we come to meditate on the word of God. When we go out, and probably tomorrow, day after, Young, 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 mama, 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 you know, you have all kinds of crazy things getting into your system, which is disturbing your thought processes. Okay? It's telling you, you know what's happening? Pastor was talking to the newspapers, the reports of the newspapers, the reports of the medical doctors. You've got to have an alternative, parallel media that is confusing your thought process. What's going to happen? Nothing is going to happen. If God be for us, who can be against us? Nothing will happen. Because that is what a, that's an awesome God that we serve. Amen. So that, that's going to happen at the mental level. Okay, he's going to play, you know, dirty games. Little children, listen to this. So you guys have prepared everything and come. Okay, just the next day is the exam. And then it, it looks like almost you've forgotten everything. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Yeah. Sounds familiar? That's the devil trying to play his tricks on you. And you got to say, by the name of Jesus, I'm going to conquer all these unwanted, confusing thoughts. Because he is the father of lies, he's the father of confusion. That's what he does for a living. So we don't allow him to thrive in his business, we have to thrive in our Lord's business. Amen? Amen. So the body protected by white blood corpuscles, the thoughts protected by God's word. Amen. Now your word says, when Satan tried to tempt Jesus, what did he say? The word says, it's the word. So we fight the dirty thoughts, the confusing thoughts, the marauding thoughts by powerful words of hope, words of truth, words of deliverance. At the spiritual level, what happens? We have confusions, right? There are times when we pray, when we fast, when we, you know, worship the Lord, and there are times when we feel we have lost it all. And sometimes I ask this funny question, where are you, Lord? Right? God's always there. He says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. But we keep asking that question, right? Where are you, Lord? Lord, I'm lost. Where are you? God's still 
still there with us. It's just that our eyes don't see them because the spiritual eyes have been blinded by the evil one. So in other words, the attacks happen at all the levels. At the physical level, at the mental level, and at the spiritual level. And at every level, we have a weapon that can destroy and annihilate the enemy because if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? Amen. Amen. Right. Now, if you go to National Geographic, there is a series which says, Animal versus Animal. Have you seen that? Animal versus Animal. So they are showing you depictions, gory depictions, of one animal annihilating another animal. And then you have man versus wife. Okay, so there's a battle between humanity and animals. Right? So there's a continuous celebration of this kind of violence, of this kind of annihilation, destruction, and destroying each other. But God tells us that he has not created us to be destroyed, but to be built, to be prospered, and to grow in his life, in his name, and in his word. You know, in the ancient times when they fought, how they fought? They used to fight with their fists, physical fights, right? Like boxing. Now they are fighting in the rings and people are paying millions to watch two fellows fight each other and bash each other. Have you seen that? Okay, they celebrate violence. Yeah. Some play games and you know, all the games are all violent games. Kids, you've got to be very careful what kind of games you play. War of the Worlds, Warcraft. Okay, that's what all these games teach us. Yeah, you've got to be very careful what kind of games you play. Right. And then what happens, you had weapons, you had swords, you had spears, you had all kinds of weapons of destruction. And then you had chariots, then they metamorphosed into tanks, then you had all kinds of planes. Today the war has taken a digital transformation, you have cyber warfare, right? So you don't even need any of these guns and uh, uh, spears, you can kill the, annihilate the enemy with the digital you know, nonsense that happens. But trust me, in all of these destructions, you have one hope, the hope in the name of our Lord, the hope in the word of our God, and the hope in the spirit of our God. Can I have an amen for that? Amen. Because all these things will continue to happen, because that's his job. He will keep continuing creating confusion, but we as children of God have a powerful hope in his name, in his word, in his spirit, and I'll also give you another interesting tool which we can use. You know, the battle that we have is a battle against the world. Because the world has a different story that it tells you. You open the newspaper, right? What happens in the front headlines? Global disasters. Some volcanic eruption. Some, you know, uh, massive earthquake. If nothing happens, the plane will crash. Okay, so you say 150, 200 people dead. That's the first page. Then you go move to the other pages. You have local disasters, regional disasters, state-wise disasters. You get into the business column, unemployment, job losses, inflation, tax problems, all kinds of worries. Will a robot take my job? All kinds of worries. You go to the sports column, betting and doping scandals. <laughs> so it says, you know, when you read all this, the world is a very terrible place. But the reality is not that. When 100 people die, there are 7 billion people protected by God Almighty. Amen. And the world is actually getting better and better and better. I'm not saying this to make you feel good. There's plenty of statistics. That's a separate session I may need to take to prove to you guys that the world is actually getting better. Every way, in every little way, God is making us better and better. And here's the good news. That more and more people are understanding the power of God Almighty. And he is shaking the hallowed portals of knowledge and wisdom. That it is all those people who are saying that, you know, God is not there. Somebody who believes in God, all those things. Those fellows are being shaken now by the latest revelations in neuroscience, quantum biology and quantum physics. They are discovering and saying, oh my God, then this must be a creator. And we have a name for that creator. His name is Yahweh. His name is Jesus. Amen. We know it very simply. We don't need any scientist to come and tell us that. The quantum biologist or quantum physicist. We know it. We know it for sure that he is the author and finisher of our lives. He is the alpha, the omega. He is the one who created everything out of nothing. Amen. And today quantum physics is getting into that realm and saying everything came out of nothing. And if that has to happen, there has to be a creator. Amen. And we are saying, yes, there is a creator. And that creator has a name. And that creator is Jesus. And he is my savior and your savior. Hallelujah. That is the reality today. So, the fight is between the world. The second battle is the battle of the flesh. We all want to be spiritual. We all want to be holy. We all want to be protected by the blood. 
But what happens is that there's a constant battle with the flesh. It could be lust, it could be pornography, it could be dirty kind of thoughts, it could be dirty kind of opinions, ideas, behaviors, because that is what the flesh tries to bring to us. But again, the battle of the flesh is beaten by the weapons of the spirit. Paul says that there's a constant, continuous battle between the flesh and the spirit, and I overcome that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the third one is, of course, the master of all these deceptions, Satan himself. You would have confusions at home, you would have children who get sick very often, you'd have financial challenges, all of these brought in with the devious mind of Satan. He's the deceiver, and he tries to destroy us, and he tries to bring about confusion. But in this battlefield of the flesh, the world, and Satan, we have, you know, God has another name, the Lord of hosts. I mean, if you look at it from the English translation, you know, you don't get the essence of it. In Tamil, it says, Senegalin Katta, which means what? The God of the armies. Our God is a God of armies. Hallelujah. You know, when the prophet was trying to, you know, engage and look at his enemies, his servant goes there and says, you know, we are outnumbered. We are outnumbered because there's so many of them and we, we are completely, we are nobody. Last time when I came, I gave you a different math. You know, Almighty God's mathematics. You remember? One plus one is greater than 850. I hope you remember that mathematics. Okay? One plus one is greater than 850. 850 fellows will be there. Looks huge. But you are one. But beside that one, you have the one. I am the, I am is there with us. Then that's greater than everything else. Amen. So a fellow goes there, he comes back and says, we are outnumbered. And we don't think, you know, we can win this war. But God prompts the prophet to say, go back, ask the fellow to go and see again. And when he sees again, behind those guys, there's a bigger, much bigger army. So the one in us is definitely greater than the one outside. Amen. Once we realize that, once we know the power of who is in us, trust me, life becomes completely different. And life has a new meaning because those battles are not, you know, fought by us. The Lord tells us, right? The battle belongs to the Lord. Him. The battle belongs to Him. Right. And you see this happening in different realms. Many, you know, in the last centuries, you had the domination of communism, right? Which was a religion that said, which was a, a thought process that said, spirituality is poison. That if you believe in God, you're going to destruct yourself. But look what is happening in history. It takes its own time. God has his own time and plan when he brings about transformation. But today you hardly find, you know, uh, even semblances of communism anywhere. Atheism is, you know, almost dying. Except for a few so-called pseudo-intellectuals who are confused. Okay? Now they can't go back because they already committed. So it will be a shame for them. So they know deep down. Okay? If you don't believe me, I'm going to share with you a very interesting... Uh, in an episode. One of the greatest uh, atheists as of now is a guy called Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins from the intellectual world is an absolutely amazing top-notch guy. He's a biologist, par excellence. So one time there was a debate between a Christian a professor and Richard Dawkins. And as the debate was going on, they of course went to the realms of uh, you know Charles Darwin and the theory of evolution which said my mama and my grandpa were all monkeys, which we don't believe by the way. So while this was going on, uh, Richard Dawkins was asked, okay, so Professor Dawkins, can you tell us the full title of Darwin's book, okay? So Richard Dawkins is stuck. He's confused because he doesn't actually get that full name. And while he's saying, oh, you're not able to get it, and Richard Dawkins, without knowing, says, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. And that's captured on candid camera. It's available on YouTube. So you can actually see Richard Dawkins. Deep down in all of us, there is a God element. There is a God part that is waiting to discover God Almighty. Some of us, by His grace, have discovered Him. Not by being a Cambridge-educated biologist, but by just a sheer grace that we have identified who the true God is. So that fellow says, oh my God. And people said, oh, Richard Dawkins? Right? Because there is God. There is that quest to seek that God Almighty. And that is where we differ from all those famous scientists. 
And then we also know that we don't fight our battles. Our battles are fought by legions of God and God's armies. God's armies, cherubim, seraphim, yeah, and they go and annihilate the enemy. We don't know how it happens. It happens in God's own style. I told you, you know, when he does that, he confounds the enemies. They fight among themselves. That's what it means when it says the battle belongs to the Lord. We never need to do any battle plans. How do I kill him? How do I? And that's not your job. Your job is how do I praise him? How do I worship him? How do I give to others? How do I be a blessing? That's all you should be thinking. And God will take care of the rest. Amen. You know, when Job prayed for his friend's deliverance, he got a double portion. So you want a double portion? Start praying for your friends. Friends, when I say they are destructive neighbors. Yeah, so friends are not friends. Yeah, that's right. All right. Okay. So for every stronghold, we have a power. That's why, you know, when God's people were filled with the spirit, filled with his power, they were able to do remarkable things. We know Samson was able to destroy, you know, just like that, the jawbone of a, of a donkey, right? Gideon was able to annihilate the enemy. You know, Gideon didn't have big weapons of uh, destruction, mass destruction, right? He had what, a pot, few pots, he had a torch, and then he had trumpets. I mean, imagine going to a war with these kind of equipments. But God wanted to prove a point, you can be the dumbest guy on the planet, with all the dumbest equipments you have, but the battle is mine and I will give you it. So if you're having, you know, weapons that can't destroy, thank the Lord for it. Because if you have them, you don't know what you will do. You know, suddenly you pull the trigger on the wrong side. So better not have any weapons of destruction. What we need is weapons of construction. Okay, build the people with God's word, build people with God's praises, build people with God's spirit. That's what we're supposed to be doing. What did David do? David had what? A sling and stones. I mean, with sting and stones, now they say scientifically it's not possible to kill such a guy. But he killed through God. That's what he said. You may come with, you know, whatever power you have, but I come with the name of my God. That's the difference between Goliath and David. And he annihilated. So the point I'm trying to emphasize is that you may have nothing with you, it doesn't matter. Because one, the battle belongs to the Lord. Two, if God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody can even touch us. And we need to have that constant revelation 24 7. Right? So we're going to see now four powerful weapons that God has for us. Okay? I'm again going to the David episode, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 14. Where David confesses, you know. The name of the Lord. So 1 Samuel <coughs> chapter 17 and verse 14. What does it say? David was now, the youngest. The youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. Yeah. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep. That's at right. Bethlehem. And then David comes over. He is the least, right? He is not even considered as a man of war. Man of valor, man of strength. But what he does is, he has something else. He has a powerful weapon which nobody knows. While he is tending sheep, okay, he is in the presence of God. He is always worshipping, praising God. He is enjoying the power of God, right? That's how he was able to tear apart a lion, tear apart a bear, and that he was able to protect his sheep. See, in other words, God was preparing for the real battle against Goliath. So when he comes and confronts Goliath, he says, I come in the name of our God, Lord of hosts. Right? He comes in the name of the Lord of hosts. We need to realize our God is a gracious God. Our God is a compassionate God. He is a kind and loving God, but he's also a God of hosts. And God of hosts is a God of armies. I mean, I never understood it the first time I read it. What are hosts? But when you read it in Tapit, you understand. It's the God of armies. Okay? So he commands those armies to fight our battles. And then what happens? You know, he fought with him. And when he had God with him, you know, you're not shaken. That's what it says. You know, when I have the Lord in front of me, I'm never shaken. Because many times what happens, the surrounding circumstances and experience shake us. They shake us, okay? 
You are so nice, you are so healthy, so powerful, so good. And suddenly you are shaken. You can see that in the body language, you can see that in the persona, you can see that in the behaviors. But he says, if you have God by your side, you will not be shaken. Say that, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. By God, by my side. With God by my side, I will never be shaken. That's the point. Otherwise, we will be shaken. You know, some of us would know this guy called Muhammad Ali, who was Cassius Clay, born as a Christian and converted into you know, Islam. And he used to fight. He was known as one of the greatest fighters of all time. You know his current status? He's suffering from Alzheimer's. The man who used to bash people up, crush their bones, crush their skulls, today can't even walk properly. Are you with me? That's what it mean, means by being shaken. But when you and I have God by our side, you will not be shaken. Think about it. You know, some of us may be elders here thinking, oh my God, I might get Alzheimer's. No! If you have God by your side, you will not be shaken. Right? You have to claim that. You have to claim that. You know, the best testimony I can think of is uh, the wonderful man of God, Billy Graham. He went to be with the presence of the Lord at a ripe old age of 97. That's God's grace. God's goodness. And he was preaching to the presidents and prime ministers till his last day. God can keep you. As long as you're in the Lord and in the perfect will of the Lord, no weapon that's formed against us can destroy us, Amen. can even touch us. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Right, so that's the name of the God that is so powerful. Now let us look at how powerful it is. Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. Jesus Christ, the name above all, all names. I want you to read with me that particular verse. Verse is wrong. Yeah. That in the name of Jesus, that's the name we have. Every knee shall bow of those in heaven. This is amazing. You know, you're thinking it's just an earthly thing that all of us worship him in veneration. Every knee in heaven. I mean the angels, the archangels, the cherub cherubims, the seraphims, all of them, and those on the earth, those under the earth, I don't know who they are, don't ask, okay? Those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus, say that, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can we say that Jesus Christ is my Lord? God is watching that. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Is my Lord. You know, you've got to have that name because that's the name which is given all power on heaven and earth. Amen. And you and I can utter that name so powerfully and so joyfully because he has given us that inheritance. Right? He, call, he says, you can call me by my name. You ask in my name, you will get anything you want. Amen. And he says another interesting thing in John. And in 14 he says, ask anything in my name. In John 16, it says, you haven't asked anything in my name. Some of us may be John 16 here. Sitting here, haven't asked anything in his name. It's probably time to call out the name above all names. Amen. Why is it so powerful? Because every knee on heaven, understand this. That's the name we are talking. Every knee in the earth and every knee underneath the earth. Right? All of them obey and revere the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the name. So when you are confronted with a sickness, confronted with a confusion, confronted with a challenge, say, Jesus. Amen. Let me give you another interesting Amen. testimony that happened yesterday. So our, our boss was in a bad mood. Bad mood because the targets were all being challenged. And my immediate subordinate who reports to me was being threatened, virtually threatened. So when he went out, he said, I think maybe we should do something. And you know, we probably need to look for options. He's a good believing, Bible believing, you know, praising man of God. All I did was I have no weapons, I have no you know answers. But I have one thing. What is that? The name of Jesus. So deep inside my spirit, I'm saying, Jesus, take care, Lord, take care of your child. 
you know, he's going through the battle now. He's, he's on the firing range. So he comes back after 10 minutes, getting all the, you know, the target details, all the reports, everything. And little by little, as he starts explaining, something transforms happening. It really happened eh, yesterday, last afternoon. It was a live testimony how the power of Jesus works. Amen. And little by little, you can see some transformation of the face, the face that was very rugged and rigid and angry and frustrated, slowly starts becoming more calm and more pleasant. That's what he is actually. And then the, again, the guy had to leave for something else to pick up some other paper. And trust me, this is a confession I'm making. Chris, I think I made, made a mistake. This guy is really doing his job. He's doing his best. Why? Because the name of Jesus makes the other person see the reality. Friends, I, I witness this almost on a daily basis. Amen. Okay? You need to know how to use this powerful weapon. Jesus, the name above all names. You know, the name above all names. What does it mean? Every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, and every knee under the earth is worshipping him, revering him. That's why it's the name above all names. Amen. Amen. And what does that name mean? What does Jesus mean? Redeemer. Deliverer. So when you use that name, you say, my Redeemer, redeem me from this situation. My Deliverer, deliver me from this situation. You know, Isaiah put it beautifully. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Can you go for that quickly? Isaiah, because thousands of years back, Isaiah made that beautiful, uh, you know, prophetic uh, utterance. He said his, his name will be called. Yeah. For, for go ahead. Five things. Yeah. Nine six. For to us a child is born. Yeah. To us no, no, let's, let's go for okay. Read it. Read it. No, read it. Read it. Yeah. For to us a child is born. Ah. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. Yeah. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. No, 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 no. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. prophet Isaiah prophesying the birth of Jesus Christ and he's describing it. For unto us a child will be born. This child will have the garment which is the entire world's in authority on him and his name will be called Wonderful. The name of all names is Wonderful. What is Wonderful? Wonderful is things that you can't imagine. Things that you can't expect. Things that you can't describe. As Wonderful. Right? He's a wonder working God. We can sing that in Sunday school, but we forget that he's a wonder working God. Ayo Poche. Right? Wonder working God. He's a wonderful God. And again, what does it say? Counselor. We go to all the counselors. I've told you one day about experts. Remember, monkeys are better than human beings when it comes to predictions. Even professors. Monkeys are better than professors. It's been proven. So point is, don't go to anybody. The counselor. And God Almighty, the counselor. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit as the counselor. Amen. Holy Spirit, what should I be doing? What advice do you give? So that name has so much of power and potency. The power to create and give wonderful, miraculous breakthroughs. The power to give you and me the right kind of guidance and advice and counsel. What's the third one? Mighty God. I don't know how to describe this. Mighty is mighty. There's nothing in front of him that has any power. He's beyond mighty. In fact, it's actually almighty, which means he's all powerful, right? Exceedingly powerful. So we have such a God. When you say, when you utter the name Jesus, remember next time, he's wonderful, he's my advisor, counselor. He is Almighty God. He is Prince of Peace. Because many times the problem with us is we don't have peace. Peace is the problem, right? We are peace, peace. We are peace is because we don't have peace. Peace, peace of poetry. So the point is that peace, who can give? He says he is the Prince of Peace. And he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. You don't know how it happens. You're going through challenges, you just smile. How does it come, brother? Because I have the peace that passes all understanding. Because I have the Prince of Peace, who is my 
God Almighty, who is my counselor, who is my mighty God, who is wonderful, and it also says, is an everlasting Father. It doesn't say Father. It says, everlasting Father. That means it lasts, and lasts, and lasts, forever. Praise God. Forever. Amen. So that is the God that we have. Because there are times when our earthly fathers may distance themselves. Our earthly fathers might suddenly, you know, suddenly decide not to do it. Okay? So is the same with sons. You know, there's a trend that's happening in many parts of India, among wealthy people especially. So they, as the wealthy fathers, you know, in the right the will and say that, you know, all this is for my children. And they do one mistake. So probably it's a wise advice for fathers and mothers here. You know, they write it and they allow the child to inherit during their time. So there are many instances of children kicking out fathers. So fathers, rather than, you know, showing love, are virtually on the streets. There are many cases, very prominent people who virtually become penniless and filled with poverty and distress. Now look at the other side. There are fathers who are so frustrated with their children that they write their inheritance to cats and dogs and charities and all kinds of things. <laughs> but here it says, our God, the name above all names, right, for whom all the knees will bend and bow, is an everlasting Father. Amen. That's why He loved us so much. That he said, okay, these guys cannot be allowed to be destroyed further. That I will send my own son. That I will manifest myself in my son. And give them a new life. Give them a new hope. Give them eternal life. Right? So that is the name that we speak. So when we say, we bring in the name of Jesus, we are bringing all these powerful qualities into picture. You know, Apostle Peter does something remarkable. In the Acts of the Apostles, he is now... The emancipated Peter. The Peter who wasn't the backslidden Peter who, you know, persecuted and who spoke ill of Jesus when he was not filled with the Spirit. This was Peter after Acts 2. When he's filled with the Holy Spirit, when he's filled with the power of God. And as he's walking across, you know, there's a sick guy saying, please heal me. And what does he say? I don't have gold. Silver and gold I have. Have I not? But what I have is... A name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, and that name can heal you. And just say that, that guy was healed. Today we need to understand the power of the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not for nothing that Holy Spirit said that name is above all names. Above all names, right? Because he had that power. And then, you know, Paul Apostle says, with that we move to the next one. Colossians 3.17. Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed. Whatever you do. Whatever. Okay, whatever. Again, I'm repeating. Whatever you do in word or deed. Do all. You know, when you read the words, you need to read it word by word. Only then you get the significance. What do you do? In word or deed, do all. all. Which means everything you do in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Can we do that as a confession that whatever we do from now, we will do it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Can I have hands up? Amen. Say, everything we do, Lord, we will do it in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to Almighty God. Amen. Amen. He is a good God. He has seen that. That's why He gave us a promise. He said, in my name, you will chase devils. Let's use that. Let's use that power that He's given us. So the next time you're confronted with a challenge, Say the name of Jesus with all faith because in whatever you do, do it with the name of Jesus Christ. 
Second one is the word of God. Ephesians 6.17 says, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the word of God is a sword. It's a sword of the Spirit. So in the spiritual realm, we said that the battle is at the spiritual realm. And the battle at the spiritual realm is beaten by the word of God. Many years back, Joel Austin's mother, you know, the famous preacher, was struck with cancer. And in those days, please remember the context of the story. No internet, no Google search. Today, our lives are much more simpler. So you want to find words of healing, put a Google search. Within a few seconds, you'll find passages, all the passages in the Bible that give you words of healing. But this wonderful mother did not have those privileges. This was 1940s, 50s maybe. Okay. So what she was doing, she would go through the Bible, entire Bible, pick up specific words about healing. Okay. And she would internalize it. By his stripes we are healed. Okay. There will be no sickness or affliction against me. So she takes all those powerful words of promise and starts internalizing. But here's the best part. Not only would she internalize, she is a cancer patient. She would visit cancer hospitals. She would visit cancer hospitals, meet with cancer patients, and tell them these words of faith. Tell them that the Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. That there will be no weapon of affliction that will be formed against you. And she will go on repeating these things. Guess what? Within a few years, cancer ran away. Yes. She lived and died a healthy life in her 80s because the word of God, the sword of spirit, has the power to heal. Has the power to heal. We need to understand the significance of this. So, yes, you might want to go and take a doctor's opinion. And now, you know, hospitals also give you a free second opinion. Yes, yeah, so you can go and have a second opinion. Free. Okay. Uh, all that is fine, but I think beyond all that is the healing power of God's word. <clears throat> you know, Paul says, very interesting passage in Acts 20:29. 20, he warns the wolves around us after he leaves. Okay, he said there'll be wolves, there'll be a lot of confusions, a lot of destruction that is happening in your churches. But he also says something, you know, which is nice. 20, 31, go to 31, same ch chapter 31. Therefore, watch ah. and remember. Watch and remember. That for three years, ah. I did not cease to warn everyone. Ah. Night and day will Night and day. So, what he says, there will be these enemies around, these wolves around. But what I need to do is watch out and use the word of God. So, you know, there would be times when there's going to be a famine for the word of God. Because there could be times when you may not be able to use the word of God. So it is nice to internalize these verses, you know. Uh, so if you're writing notes, you can make a note, right? Uh, you know, you want deliverance from sickness. Isaiah 53, 5, I don't have time, so I'm rushing quickly. Exodus 15, 26, 1 Peter 2, 24. These are verses of divine healing and health, okay? Use these words. Write those words, you know, probably print those words and put them in different places and start uttering them. And as you start uttering them, they start getting internalized into your system. So the next time you don't need to refer the Bible, you don't need to check it out. It's right there for you in your internal system. When you're in depression, because a lot of times the devil brings about confusions and depression. Okay. Um, Proverbs 28.1. Because a righteous man is like a lion. The righteous man is like a lion. So obviously you need to check, make that check. Am I righteous enough to be a lion? If you're righteous, you don't need to worry. You don't need to fear. Because the days are getting even worse. But in that which God is going to make us like lions. God also speaks through Paul. You know, to Timothy he says, not the spirit. God has not given us the spirit of fear. I don't know why we... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Many times miss out this powerful word. 
not given us a spirit of fear. Why do we need to fear? Fear is something that the devil tries to bring to confound us, to, you know, to create confusion. But God clearly says through his word that he has not given us a spirit of fear. Yeah. On the contrary, you know, 2 Timothy 1, 7, but of power, love, and clear mind. I want you to say that. I want you to confess that. Can we have that word, please? 2 Timothy 1, 7. Yeah. Can we all read that? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? Amen. Confess it in His presence. He has not given us a spirit of fear. We don't need to fear. Love, which means what? The love to forgive. The love to be compassionate. The love to give. The love to pray for others. The love to have burden for others. That is love. Clear mind. You don't need any confusion. He has given us that clear mind. Once you are in Jesus, you have a clear mind. Amen. And then, He has given us, given us, power. Say that. Power. He has given me power. Some of you are powerless. Say, I, He has given me power. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we need to be clear in our priorities that He is that powerful God. Right? And then, when darkness rules, you know, you have darkness. Then what do you do? Hebrews 13, 5, 6. We all know this. My God, Lord Jesus, will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. Say that. Okay, my God, Lord, will never leave me nor. God, you promise me. You, know, you have to, to claim that as a promise, as a apart. Tell him, God, you told me in your promise, and never leave me, Lord. And then claim that as a promise. And then, when you have anger, when you have frustration, Romans 5.5, 5, because what will happen again, probably we can see that, Romans 5.5, 5, quickly. Yeah. Now, hope does not disappoint, hope with God Almighty, because the love of God has been poured in our hearts. Oh boy, oh boy. By the Holy Spirit, who has given it. Love of God is poured, and it? Not even given in Given like total, total, like drops. It's poured. Amen. Violently poured into us, into our hearts. That love of God. You know, once you have the love of God, you know, your life will never be the same. Amen. It has to be different. Amen. In our actions, in our attitudes, in our thoughts, in our behaviors. Right? So I've given you enough references. And, uh, you know, that's how you use the word of God. Here's a third one. This is a nice one. Tearful prayer. Did you know tearful prayer can move the hand of the Lord? Yeah? Let me give you quickly three examples. Okay, so here's this lady, Hagar, who's been thrown out by Sarah, Abraham's rightful, righteous wife. Well, she was righteous, who would debate that day. So now Hagar is in the desert with her child, and she's confronted with a basic survival problem. She has no water for a child. She's also going to die. She has to, she has to decide the priority. Who's going to die first? And she's given up. At that hopeless situation, in the middle of a desert, she cries out to the Lord. The Lord hears that. And he created an entire generation to be blessed because of Hagar's tearful prayer. Here's another one. Jacob, who was a deceiver till that time, till that Jabok you know, river encounter, was an imitator. He was a cheat. And at that time, he knows he has to face his brother, whom he had cheated. Now he's crying out. He's saying, Lord, take care of me. Okay? So, tearful prayers move the heart of God. And we know what happened. Not only did he transform Jacob into Israel, he blessed him, and through him, Nations were blessed. Right? So that's what happened. Now the third one. Hezekiah. Somebody comes and tells you, you know, in the next 10 years, you're going to die. The one thing that keeps us hope with hope and belief is, we don't know the date of our deaths. So till then, we're very happy. But somebody tells you you're going to die, so and so. You know, that's the worst thing that can happen. That's exactly what happened to Hezekiah. The Bible says, he turned his face towards the wall and cried out. 
And God said, okay. Isaiah, go back. Go back and tell him that his years have been extended. Right? Tearful prayers. God answers tearful prayers. Because what happens? When you pray with tears, your heart is broken. Amen. When your heart is broken, your inner self is being revealed to God. You're not being deceptive. Amen. You know, a lot of us would run around, you know, shaking. How, how are you, brother? I'm fine. I'm fine. But deep down, you're not fine. And you've actually deceived. But when you break yourself in the presence of God, you're completely revealing your true self. Amen. That's what the psalmist did in Psalm 51. You know, the broken, contrite heart. When it completely breaks, God will never ever, you know, reject that. After that, such a big sin that fellow did. But Psalm 51 was his transforming moment because the key there is his heart broke. He said, Lord, I'm nothing. You know, many times when you go through challenges, challenges of sin, here's a very important insight. We may need to revisit Psalm 51. Sit in the presence of the Lord. Get right with him. Because that's the time the devil will play tricks in your mind. Ah, you've done this. You now cannot hear your redemption is gone. Your salvation is gone. Your holiness is gone. You know, your blessing, your anointing is gone. And after that, you have this peculiar fear that you don't want to go closer to God. Are you with me? Yes. But here's the insight. We all are human. We all have, you know, this challenge of the flesh and the lust and the world. And Satan, go back to him with a broken contrite heart and say, Lord, I, I, I've done it. I'm sorry, Lord. I need to come back to you. Amen. I need to come back to you, Lord. Amen. And when you break that heart with tears, God will not reject it. He will accept it and transform you and say, this guy is a guy who is very close to my heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's the key to the third. The third one, the first one is the name of God, name of Jesus. Second one is the word of God. The third one is a tearful prayer. Tearful <coughs> prayer. The fourth one, and with that we will close, is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 59, 19. Isaiah 59, 19, beautiful. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The enemy is not coming in single. He's coming like a flood. He's coming to gush you, to overwhelm you. And here's the Holy Spirit of the Lord who is standing, you know, who is protecting you defending you with that armor of God. And the Holy Spirit, please remember, manifests right from verse 1, Genesis 1, chapter 1. Amen. From there till Revelation, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is seen in various realms and various directions. So here's another place where he does it, that the Spirit of the Lord, when, when the enemy comes like a flood, you know, floods, many of us may not have really experienced. When a flood comes, it can destroy entire buildings. That's what we mean by a flood, not water running under the feet. Okay, we think flood means water running. And no, it is where a 20-story building falls apart because that's the gushing of the flood. When such a flood of enemies come and try to annihilate you, the Spirit of the Lord will raise that banner, raise that Stand up. Amen. So that is why that's the Jehovah Nisi for us who will give us victory. Amen. He's a very strong, he's a very gentle, genteel spirit, but he's also a mighty, powerful Amen. warrior that we need to understand. That's why when Christ left the earth, he said, I'm going to give you a comforter, a counselor. And that counselor is the Holy Spirit who will fight all the battles for us. He also said, the power, the dynamis power will come from above. Luke chapter 24 verse 49. Luke 24 49. And you will receive power. Okay. But tarry, tarry is wait. Okay. Wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued or filled with Power, not power from here. You know, power from the battery will die down. Okay, you have to recharge it. Yeah, power. But we are talking about power from above. Power from God Almighty. 
power from the realms of heaven. Power that created all the heavens and the earth with the power of his word. Amen. That power will come to you. Just wait. Amen. Right? And after that, something remarkable happens. Okay? We know what happens. In Acts chapter 2, the power of the Holy Spirit fills that place. And after that, they start speaking in tongues. They start getting tongues of fire. And after that, a whole revolution starts. A spiritual revolution starts, which is the beginning of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he intercedes. Of course, he prays and intercedes for us. Right? So there's a testimony of a, of a child of God, a mother who was at home. And she was a spirit-filled, prayerful mother who would spend hours speaking in tongues and worshipping the Lord and praising Him. And as she's working in the home, she suddenly is confronted by a live cobra. You know, cobras have this nasty way of putting their heads up. So obviously the sister had no idea what to do with the cobra, so she's looking and she's very frightened, confused. But she also knows that she has the power of the Holy Spirit. And all she does was looks at that uh, snake, that rising, you know, snake, and prays in tongues. And when she is praying in tongues, little by little, that fellow's head is slowly gone, and he's sitting like a cat. Goodness. And after some time, she obviously calls others to hit the snake. Till the snake is hit, he's waiting to be hit and killed. <laughs> See this? It's a real testimony. So what we're trying to say is, many times when we're confronted, snake is a symbol of Satan, right? So any of these satanic affronts, any of these satanic assaults come across, we need to be filled. We need to, first of all, be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you start using the power of the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues, rebuke that power. And you don't know how it happens, but that's how it happens. Because this is a life testimony of a sister who actually saw that. And that fellow, you know, it says that he put his head down and he never got up till he got beaten and killed. Don't ask me how. But that's what the Holy Spirit does for us, right? The power of speaking in tongues, the power of the Holy Spirit or what? The evil one. Right. And we've seen that even in the Old Testament. Samson was filled with the Spirit when he was in the Lord. Gideon was filled with the Spirit when he was in the Lord. David was filled with the Spirit when he praised and glorified God. So the Holy Spirit that was there right from the beginning of time is today also with us. Amen. God has today given us four powerful weapons. In a battle that we are facing at the physical level, at the spiritual level, and at the mental level. God has given us four powerful and simple you know, weapons. The weapon called the name of Jesus, the name of all names, and now we know what that name signifies. The extremely powerful word of God, and I want to finish with this. And the third one was the tearful prayer. And the fourth is the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, in 18th century, when France was going through a revolution, the French philosopher, Voltaire, said that the entire scientific revolution is being destroyed by this evil black book, the black book called the Bible. And he said if he destroyed this black book, yeah, humanity will be better off. So he had this grand vision of destroying the tens of, by then Gutenberg had printed lots of uh, Bibles, so there are tens of Bibles and tens of thousands of Bibles in circulation. But Voltaire said this, and Voltaire being a highly respected uh, philosopher, the French government started putting down, you know, and tearing down all the Bibles, whichever Bibles they could tear and burn. Voltaire died. After a few more years, Voltaire died. In the 1990s, the French Bible Society was looking for a place, a home to print Bibles. And they stumbled upon Voltaire's home. And they converted Voltaire's home to print Bibles, not only in French, but in many languages. So that's why the Bible says, heavens and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Amen. So keep that in your mind, that the word that we worship, the word that we meditate, the word that we live, the word that we articulate, stands the test of time. Amen. No Voltaire's, no Richard Dawkins can throw that out. You and I have four powerful weapons. The name of all names, Jesus Christ. The word of God, the living word of God, the liberating word of God, the healing word of God. A tearful prayer filled with a broken and contrived heart. And lastly, the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow down our hands, stand up, and wait for the Lord to give us these four weapons that we can use when 
these challenges confront us. We've heard it from his mouth. I was just a mouthpiece. I was just uttering things the Lord told me to share with you. The word was confirmed in the worship. Lord is our defense. The word was confirmed by pastor when he said, if God be for us, who can be against us? The word got confirmed with those four weapons that we would use. Simple, mighty weapons that can be used to face any of our challenges. Any of our challenges. If God be for us, who can be against us? In the name of God, the spirit of God, the word of God, and of course a tearful prayer with a broken heart. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time of meditation. Lord, thank you for speaking to us about the power of your name, the power of your word, the power of your spirit, the power of a tearful prayer. Thank you, Master, for comforting, consoling, uplifting your children, Lord. Thank you, Master, for telling us that your word still lives and your word has power to bring. Your word has power to deliver. Your power has word to heal us, Lord to build us and to make us better and better, reflecting your glory and reflecting your magnificence. We ask all this in the mighty master's name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.